you with that. All right, let's get into the sermon. So I prepared, hopefully, a very balanced diet for you this morning. I want to preach on the subject of compassion and pity. Compassion and pity. And these are really, actually, extremely important attributes and characteristics that, as Christians, we, we ought to have. But as I said, it's going to be balanced because just like with every teaching and every doctrine and everything that we read in the Bible, there's, there's always um, a, ti there's a, there's a time, just like in Ecclesiastes, a time to love, a time to hate, right? There's, there's a time for compassion. There's a time to refrain from having compassion. There's, there's a time for all of these things. So I want to cover both. Now, overwhelmingly, though, our way of life, how we live, how we're characterized ought to be one that's characterized by having compassion and pity. It's something that we, we ought to strive to make sure that we have as part of our life. I'm going to read some verses just from the Psalms for you, just regarding God, right? The Heavenly Father and His compassion. Psalm 86:15, the Bible says, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. Psalm 111 verse 4 says, He hath made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Psalm 112 verse 4, Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. Psalm 145 verse 8, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. Now, I, I like to balance things because... You know, as an independent fundamental Baptist church, you know, we preach on sin a lot. I preach on negative things a lot. I, you know, I teach and I preach on these things because we need them, because they're necessary. We need to have a fear of God. But we need to understand that God isn't just on this hairpin trigger to just destroy everyone and everything. Right? We don't want to I don't want to give you an unbalanced view. Okay? Even in your life. Seriously, we, we, while we need to have that, yes, the proper fear of God, and yes, a respect of God, but not just respect, but even a fear of God in our life, that's going to tell us, hey, yeah, there's no way I would even consider fornicating or committing adultery or you know, getting into some grievous sin because I fear what God's going to do to me. At the same time, you ought not to just be living your life afraid to do anything like, you have to walk on eggshells of just like, man, I don't want God to just go, wham! Like, any second of your existence. Because God is loving and compassionate and merciful, okay? And, and we ought to be able to go through life knowing God is very forgiving. God has compassion on us. He understands us. He knows the struggles that we go through. And it's not to just, so you, you always want to be careful not to get to a place where you're going to be justifying your own sin or downplaying your sin as if it's not a big deal. Because that's one extreme of just, oh, well, God's so loving and merciful and kind and everything else that anything I do is just going to be okay. You don't go down that path. That, that's, that's losing the proper fear of God and the respect for God and his word. But at the same time, you don't want to go to the other extreme where literally like every single thing, you're just going to be, you know, terrified that, you know, God's going to rain up and cloud on you. You, you need to have, we need to have that proper balance. And we, we see this exhibited also. There's a lot of these truths that are exhibited in many, many, many places in Scripture. I mean, this is, this is thematic. The compassion of God can be seen in many, many ways. And the first place we're going to look at here and spend a little bit of time on is in Matthew chapter 18 that we just read, where it talks about the, the, forgive, excuse me, the forgiveness of debt. And being able to have compassion on someone that's in a bad place, that's in a tight spot, that's not able to pay up the debt that they, you know, they rightfully owe, it's their business. But we see here the master who has compassion. And of course, that's symbolic of God. That master is symbolic of God who has compassion and mercy. And he's willing to show us compassion and mercy. But we ought to then 
also exhibit in like manner that compassion and mercy in our own life as well and in our dealings with other people that ought to show through that godliness should come through because that's a good a great attribute of god that we should strive to to implement in our lives as well look at verse number 26 the bible says the servant therefore fell down this is this is a servant that that had a debt that he owed he fell down and worshiped him saying lord have patience with me and i will pay thee all and we can't overlook any aspect of any of these stories that we read about because there are some details that are important too okay this guy doesn't come to his lord with the flippant attitude of just like well whatever i don't have the money so what are you going to do right he's not a jerk about it he's, he's not just okay whatever it's been a bad week it's been a bad month i don't know what to tell you no, what does he do? He, he falls down, okay? He falls down on his face and humbles himself and says, Lord, have, have patience with me. And he says, you know what? I'll pay you back. I'll pay you all. Please, just, just give me a little bit of time. I'm going to make this right. He's entreating. He's humble. Verse 27, then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion. So he sees this and he feels for having compassion for someone else you're feeling for them you're, you're you, you can see the situation that they're in and you want to be able to help that person it says then the lord of was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave he said you know what you don't owe me anything i'm just going to forgive you of that debt obviously he's having a hard time he's got debts and when and when you're in debt man and you're and you're struggling you get, you know, oftentimes you'll get deeper and deeper into debt. You know, you're trying to keep your head above water. I mean, one forgiveness of debt can make a huge difference in people's lives, especially if they're wise going forward then to say, okay, I'm not going to get myself into that mess. But it really can mean a lot, especially in an instance like that. And this, and this guy sees that. He has compassion. He says, you know what? Forget about it. I'm going to bless you and, and don't worry about that debt. But now we see the same guy. He started off right, with the right attitude, with the attitude of humility, with the attitude of, of, of willing to do whatever he needed to do to get the debt paid, to make things right. But now when the tables are turned, it says, but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid his hands on him, and this was, is, it's way less than what he owed, okay? The hundred pence is much less than what he owed to his debtor. So he was already forgiven of a lot. And now we find someone else that owes him a hundred pence. He laid his hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me that thou owest. And oftentimes people can get in this situation where, oh, yeah, when, when you're going through the hard times, when everything's bad for you, you're on your knees, you're praying, you're begging for mercy, you're, you're seeking God's favor. But then all of a sudden, when you're in good standing, now all of a sudden you feel so proud and high and mighty, and you're going to tell everyone else the way it is, and, no, you owe me, so you just pay me that debt. There's, you know, you borrowed that from me. You knew what you were doing when you got into that debt. What are you thinking? You know, after he just got released from his own situation and not being able to recognize their the difference and look as Christians especially consider this maybe someone who's more of a mature Christian or someone who's been saved longer or someone maybe who hasn't gone through uh, and made some of the bad choices that some people make in their life right and looking at you know you've received forgiveness Maybe God's overlooked a lot of your transgressions and shown you mercy with the mistakes you've made in your life, and now you've cleaned your act up. Don't forget to still be able to have compassion for those who are going the right direction, right? They're doing the right things. They're not, they're not having a bad attitude. They're not stiff-necked and rebellious and just wanting to continue in sin, but they want to do what's right, and they're trying to come to church. They're trying, look. And, and they're, maybe they're not where you're at. But don't look down on the people 
and just and and just treat them with this like you're higher and holier than thou type of an attitude you are just the one that received mercy from God. Right. Remember that and be able to show that on other people. Have that compassion for your brothers and sisters in Christ especially. So this guy, verse 29 says, and his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him saying, have patience with me and I'll pay thee. Exactly the same situation. I mean, I don't even know how this couldn't trigger in his own mind going, I was literally right there. And don't ever forget this. You know, the, God warns the children of Israel when dealing with strangers. He says, hey, you are a stranger in a strange land. Remember, you were in bondage. Remember where you came from. Don't forget your past before you feel like now you're so much better than everyone else and you've gotten past all this. Look, don't forget where you come from. It'll help keep you humble and remind you to have the compassion that's already been shown on you. The mercy and compassion that you've received. You're not better than anyone else. It's not like you deserve it and they don't because you're so great and they're not. But look, if, if, if people are fitting the same thing, this person, one person versus another person, they're both being humble, they're both falling on their knees, their face, they're, they're both seeking for mercy, they're both, look, it's the right path. Show the compassion. Verse 30 says, and he would not. He, he wouldn't hear it. But went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. He just, nope, you're going to pay it. We're going to throw you into prison. You're just going to pay off the debt that way. Verse 31, so when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. So they're just like, I can't believe this guy's doing this. I mean, he was literally in the same situation, and now he's treating people this way. Then his Lord, after he, that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desiredst me, just, just because you wanted me to. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And I just want to point that out, too, because we're looking at some other verses. We're talking about compassion and pity. And the Bible's using these basically interchangeably. Right, having compassion on someone and showing pity. So when we read about being pitiful, it's not, you know, we, we look at pitiful oftentimes in, in the way that we use the word today as, as uh, very demeaning and weak, and you're like, oh, that's pitiful. That's pitiful. You, you, you know, you could press only 50 pounds, that's pitiful, right? <laughs> Pathetic. But part, you know, and there's some, there's some truth to that usage, but Really, they'll be able to show, pay. It's, it's, people are weak, right? People are in a state of, of um, needing help and needing assistance and not as strong. And, that, and that's where that comes from. But being able to show pity isn't something that should be demeaning, <laughs> right? That's, the, that's the, the point I want to get across here. It should be something that you can still uh, hold people in honor while being able to show pity and having compassion on people as well. Um, here we see now the result of the wicked servant who did not have the right heart, who did not show the compassion and the pity that he ought to have had. Verse 34 says, And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So he's like, you know what? That debt? No, forget it. You're, you're, now you're going to pay off your debt. If that's the way that you want people, you're going to deal with people, then that's the way that you're going to be dealt with. So likewise, and this is, this is the message now, because this was all just kind of a parable, a story, and here's the application. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. So God's going to see the way that you have compassion and pity and mercy on people, and it's going to be applied exactly the same way to you. So I'll turn, if you would, quickly to 1 Peter chapter number 3. And really, when you think about the mercy that you've received, I, I mean, I can't speak for anyone else, but I can speak for myself. 
I know, I know how much mercy the Lord has shown and still shows on me as a sinful human being. And I could think back on all the things I've done wrong in my life. And I probably can't even think of all the things I've done wrong in my life. But the big things and the events that stick out and the sins that I've struggled with and the sins that I've had and, and go, you know, God really has shown a lot of compassion and mercy on me. And I could say that quite frankly, even, even apart from my own salvation, which in itself is huge, of having the compassion and mercy of granting forgiveness of sins that deserves an eternity of hell. Outside of that, if we just put that aside, as a, as a, a father chastens his son and disciplines the amount of compassion and mercy that I know I've received after salvation, being saved, and still not living up to the standard that I know that the Lord has set for all of his children to walk under. And it, it, I, look, I've definitely been chasing the Lord, no doubt about it. But thinking about all of the mistakes and problems and things, you know, it's like, man, God has really shown and extended so much mercy. And I'll tell you this much, obviously, when other people do you wrong, because that's the context, we do God wrong, and he shows mercy to us. So when people do us wrong, we ought to be able to have the mercy and compassion and pity to allow for that and just look past it and forgive people. Also, though, when it comes even just to parenting, keep that in mind as well. Think about the compassion that your Heavenly Father has had on you. Now, look. You need to have standards. We need to have rules. We need to be able to chase in and discipline our children. Of course. Of course. But don't let it get to the point, you know, as I said earlier, you know, people are supposed to fear God. But don't let it get to the point where the kids are literally like, if I, if I creak the floorboard, dad's going to flip his lid and, and, you know, who knows what's going to happen or whatever. Right? Like, like it, it should never be like that. That means you're being too strict. That means you're not being merciful. Because, look, as important as discipline is, and I'm a strong proponent of that, parenting also requires mercy and compassion. A lot. A lot, okay? Because you want to be able to train your children and love them and make sure they know that you love them and that you're there for them and that they can still make mistakes and especially as they're going to try to improve and have a good attitude, show compassion and love and mercy. There's always a line. Always. There's a line with God. And there's a line here. We're going to cover that in just a minute. There's a line. But as long as you're not crossing and stepping over that line, don't forget the compassion and the love and the mercy and the pity. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 8. And I've, I've only handpicked a few passages. This is all throughout the Bible, as you probably very well know. Verse number 8 says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. I mean, the very first thing he's saying here in, in this verse, be of all one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful. All three of those statements, compassion, love as brethren, be pitiful, all go hand in hand. Of the attitude and the spirit we ought to have towards one another, be courteous. And then it says in verse 9, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. So what does that mean? Someone does you wrong. Someone does evil unto you. Someone rails against you. Someone transgresses against you. You have the compassion and the pity and the cur courtesy to love and overlook other people's transgressions against you and show that mercy and not have to demand it at, you know, every infraction that someone might do against you. And, and just take it to heart. If you can't show that compassion and mercy, then God will start dealing with you the same way to give you a little taste of your own medicine. 
Not rendering evil for evil, railing, railing, but contrarywise blessing. He's like, actually, the exact opposite of that. You should be blessing, knowing that ye are there unto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. It's like, that's how God wants you to be. And you give the blessing, and you know, God will bless you. Flip over to 1 John chapter 3. You're in 1 Peter chapter 3, just a couple pages uh, forward in your Bible to 1 John chapter number 3. We're going to look at verses 17 and 18. 1 John chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. But whoso hath this world's good. It's talking about wealth, this world's good, right? God's blessed you, and you have wealth in this world. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother hath need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? This is talking about you see a brother or sister that's in need, and I've, I've brought this up many times, there's a difference between being in need and in want. And, and I, when I say want, I'm talking about our current usage of the word want, not the biblical usage of the word want. Okay, because literally, the biblical usage of the word want is like you have a need. Okay, you're, you're, you're lacking something. Our modern usage of the word want is I desire. Right? So let's not ever confuse someone's desire to have the newest smartphone that's on the market <laughs> or this great new fancy car or house or what you know all these luxury things that we have let's not confuse that with someone in need okay when people are in need you need food you need clothing you need you know a, a roof over your head you, you're going to need some things to, to 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 help out you know we have um you know someone in church that's that's not employed they have need that and they're and they're seeking and they're trying or doing everything they can but hey look that could that that qualifies as someone in need right like, well let's help let's help them out right let's do let's, let's, let's have compassion and mercy and show our love and say especially those that have this world's good and you see hey here's someone look they're doing what they're supposed to be doing let's help them out he said, how dwells the love of God in you if you shut up your bowels of compassion? They, they just need to deal with it on their own. You know, it's like, really? Come on. And then verse 18 says, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue. Because that's easy. It's easy to say how much you love people and how you know, God bless you and, and everything else with your tongue. It says, but in deed and in truth. But let's, actually, let's actually follow that up with action. You know, when you say something, how about you, how about you follow through and do something about it? How about you show your love, you manifest that love in deed and in truth? Amen. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this sermon, and if you came in a little bit late, okay, the, all the good, positive stuff, I just am wrapping up, okay? I'm teaching about having compassion and pity, but it needs to be balanced. Okay, because we don't want to go overboard. And just like, I'll, I'll read a few verses from Ecclesiastes 3, very, very famous passage. Turn, if you would, to 1 John chapter 5. You're in chapter 3, just flip over to chapter 5. Ecclesiastes 3 starts off like this. There, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. And it goes on and on with these various things that are kind of opposites of each other. Saying, you know, there's a time for war, there's a time for peace. There's a time to love, there's a time to hate. There's a time for all these various things in life. Nothing is just completely just one-sided. And that's what uh, Christianity today oftentimes is be like, well, it's God is love, and just people want to repeat God is love over and over and over again. Well, you know what? God is love and God is wrath. That's right. Okay, there's a time where God loves and there's a time when God hates. There's a time for, for all these various things. And even when it comes to our courtesy, our compassion, our pity, very important. But this doesn't go completely unchecked to where there is no boundary, there's no line, it's just always on. Not true. That's why I spent a little bit of time when we looked at Matthew 18 to, dis to just show, hey, in the context of this story, of this parable, 
the guy's doing what's right. The guy's already humble. The guy's already begging for, for mercy. You know, he, he's, he's getting himself in the right position. It's not every situation, okay? There's a time to have compassion, and then there's a time to not have pity. There's a time for both. And they're, they're, they're equally important. They really are. It's extremely important to be able to show compassion and mercy on people. Very, very important. Very important. For their growth, for their sake, for their help. Similarly, there's a time to not show pity and compassion, which also can be for their help. And for their benefit, it's a, it's a concept of tough love, right. of being able to say, "Okay, well, no, now I'm not going to," um, and and there's, it makes sense. This is what the Bible teaches. So, look at First John chapter five, verse number sixteen. The Bible says, "If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life, for them that sin." not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. So there's a distinction being drawn here in the Bible. And then that next verse 17 says, all unrighteousness is sin. First of all, all unrighteousness, everything that's not right is sin. And there is a sin not unto death. This is not referring to for the wages of sin is death, as in the eternal punishment of all sin. Obviously, it's drawing a distinction. Just as in chapter 3 of 1 John, it also draws the distinction between, you know, a, a person, whatsoever is born of God doth not commit sin. You know, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Well, we know it always says in chapter 1, hey, if we say that we're without sin, we, you know, we're, we're deceiving ourselves. The truth's not in us, okay? So the whole book, you got to get in context but to see these things, but it's, it's very evident, very clear, even just by looking at these couple of verses. It's making the clear distinction. It's not referring to sin in the sense that, yes, every sin carries a punishment of hell. Every sin will bring you to the lake of fire, to the second death, right? The end of all sin is death, of course. But this is referring to more of the carnal sense or immediate sense or the sense in which people could commit sins and those are sins unto death. And we see this, one, just through the law itself. There are sins that carry a punishment as a capital crime, as something that is worthy of death, and other sins and other crimes that don't carry the death penalty punishment. Similarly, not just according to God's law, but there's many instances in the Bible where we see, even though there may not be a capital crime committed, when it comes to children of God, when it comes to people who are believers, who are born again people, in their obedience to the Lord, where God will just kill people because he's upset with them with what they're doing. A perfect example of that would be when God killed all the people who were in fornication with the children of Israel outside the camp. The matter, matter of Baal Peor, if you remember that. And I think it was 75,000, if my no, I, I, don't, I don't recall if it's exactly, exactly right, 75,000, something around their life. Huge numbers of people died in one day because of that. Now, that fornication isn't a crime that's, that's given in the law as being a death penalty crime. That's not one of those instances. Someone being forced is. Someone committing adultery is. But just fornication outside of marriage is not, does not carry a death sentence in God's law. But there are times where God sees that people are committing a sin that he sees fit that it's unto death. Okay, and we see that in Scripture, and there's a high standard placed on the people of God. Okay, not just for everybody, but look, God says, you know, and, and think about even Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. What did they do? They sold a property, 
and they brought the money to the church, laid it down at the apostles' feet, and said, look, we sold our property, and we're giving it all to the church. But they didn't give it all to the church. They lied. They kept back some of the money for themselves. Now, that particular situation, they were never required to give anything to the church of some property that they owned. They didn't have to do it. It was theirs to do with as they pleased. And when they sold it, they could have given exactly what they gave, and that would have been acceptable and fine and great, and people would have been happy. Great, thank you for the great offering. But what they did was that they lied. They lied about it. Now, bearing a false witness, especially if you're not bearing a false witness against someone saying like they killed someone or whatever, you know, you, you don't have the death penalty according to God's law. But God saw it fit because they lied to the Holy Ghost about this and they were looking and seeking the praise of men more than the praise of God. And, and, and God chose that these people now were going to die and lose their life as a result. Those were sins unto death. And, and I don't want to go too deep into this because this could be a whole sermon in itself just, just explaining this. But what I want to show you is that in the Bible here, it's explaining, hey, look, there's a time to pray for sins. and pray. But you know what? When there's a sin unto death, he's saying, I don't say that you should pray for it. Because when, when, you, when you've crossed that line, there's, there's no point now. What's the point of praying? Achan, same, similar example. This, uh, the sin of Achan in, in the book of uh, Joshua, when the children of Israel were going into the promised land, they were going in, they had defeated Jericho, had that first major victory, you know, the, the walls fell down, and they had that awesome victory. And then the next battle was Ai, and they were defeated, right? And if you remember, Joshua was, was, fell on his face, and he's praying. He's praying to God, God, why, you know, everyone's going to hear about this, and then we're going to be destroyed and defeated. Oh, I wish that we would have just been satisfied with the land on the other side of Jordan. We, you know, everything would have been fine. And, and he's just confused. And what does God say? God says, get up. Get up off your face. Stand up. What are you doing praying? Look, there's people that are in sin. They had taken of the accursed thing. And that was Achan who took, you know, the garments and the silver and gold, and he, and he hid it in his, in his tent and and he needed to be dealt with, and how was he dealt with? He was put to death. That was a sin unto death, and he's saying, what, don't waste your time praying for that. You just need to deal with the problem. Deal with the sin. Deal with the, with the situation as it stands. But there's plenty of other sins that you do pray for. So it, there's times when different approaches are appropriate. There's a line that needs to be drawn. And look, the line that needs to be drawn is good for all of society. A societal standard ought to be in place so people just don't fall to the depths of depravity. I mean, if you just had mercy and love and compassion across the board, just no boundary, Always, 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 look. Where, where's the stopping point? You're going to end up seeing people as a result of that going to the, the depths of depravity. It's going to the worst case scenario more frequently. Because there, there needs to be a, a point where you say, look, this is enough. We have compassion. We have mercy. We have love. But look, when it gets to this point, like a sin unto death, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm stopping. There's no point. In God's, in God's law, and flip back if you were to Deuteronomy chapter 7, there are specific places where God warns about not showing pity, saying don't have pity. In these instances and on these judgments, in this aspect of the law, don't pity these people. Now, we've already read how pitiful and compassionate the Lord is. That goes without saying. You know, in the Psalms, his, for his mercy endureth forever. God is merciful, very merciful, as we all have experienced in our own lives. 
But especially when it comes to laws and society, and, and you know, we need to have stops in place and just say, okay, when it gets here, no more pity, no more compassion. It just needs to happen. And it doesn't even mean you hate those people, but it's for the good of everybody. There needs to be a point where we're saying, okay, we're going to carry out justice. Like this is going to have to go forward. And we're not going to allow or make allowances for people not to have judgment given that's appropriate. One of the biggest things, and it's, it's a big problem, honestly, in our country, is it's re regarding the death penalty. Just capital crimes, capital punishment. The Bible says, you're in Deuteronomy chapter 7, look at verse number 16. The Bible says, and thou shalt, uh, and this, this is before I get to the death penalty, so, so pardon me, I, I forgot where I was in my, in my notes here. Verse number 16 says, and thou shalt consume all the people which the Lord thy God shall deliver thee. Thine eyes shall have no pity upon them, neither shalt thou serve their gods, for that will be a snare unto thee. Now, what's he talking about consuming all the people? This is the people who inhabited the, the land of Israel, the Canaanites, that inhabited the land before Israel got there. They were the inhabitants. They were the ones that they needed to be defeated. And these people specifically, God commanded for them to be completely wiped out and destroyed. There's actually different aspects in God's law. There's different situations that come up. One, where he's talking about, hey, when you go into this land, you need to kill everybody. It's man, woman, child. Everybody's being destroyed. That in itself is a hard thing to do. It's hard. It's not easy. But it's what God commanded needed to be done because God was bringing his judgment on an extremely wicked people. As he's done in the past, you know, via Sodom and Gomorrah, via a worldwide flood, via, via other instances where God has just done the destruction, in this situation, he's instructing people to carry it out and be the arm of the Lord for him and go out and do this and, and inhabit this land, okay? So it's, it's what he's instructed them to do. But then there's other points where he's saying, okay, but if you go to war with anybody other than these people, then here's what you need to do. It's only, you know, the men who are fighting, like that's, that's who's going to die in the battle, in the war, people are going to die. But you don't go then and destroy their families and the women and the children. Like, you, don't, you don't do that, right? So there's, there's a standard set up there of going, yeah, I mean, the people who are fighting, yeah, that, of course, that makes sense, but you don't go and just destroy everyone. That's not right. But if we jump up to verse number one here, we're going to see a little bit more in detail what he's, what he's telling them um, to not pity and not have compassion about. Verse one says, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And he's also very careful to, to name specifically who those nations are. There should be no misunderstanding about who he's talking about. Nope, it's these are the people specifically. These are the lands. These are the, 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 the people that I am making this judgment against. He's very detailed on that. Verse 2, And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Don't show mercy. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son, for they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves and burn their graven images with fire. The biggest problem here that God is worried about, that God is concerned that's going to influence the people is to draw them away from the Lord. Now, if an entire nation gets drawn away from the Lord, what's going to happen is that all those people are going to end up dying going to hell. Yeah. We have to put this in the context and understanding, you know, especially, especially even in the United States of America, we have freedom of religion, right? Everyone can do whatever they want, and you kind of let people be, and that's great. But God's looking at this going, look, no, you're, you, you are my people. You're supposed to be following my laws. 
I'm God, you're supposed to be the lighthouse for the world to let everybody know about the Lord. And if you're going to be drawn away, God doesn't want that light extinguished. And the ramifications of such a thing, of people being drawn away from the Lord, are eternal. Because it affects eternal life. It affects people being able to even go to heaven when God is cast out. So it's, it's like the, the worst crime, like one of the, one of the biggest concerns to, to come up, more so even than, than something happening in the physical realm. When, when God is cast out, that's huge. And he doesn't want that to happen. So he's creating these laws to prevent the spread of the false prophets and the false religion and false gods. And it's righteous because there is one God. There is one truth. There is one Savior. And people who want to, to say otherwise are leading people to, to hell. And that's real. And that's a fact. And that is happening. And that is going to happen. Is, you know, people keep preaching against Christ. People preaching against the Lord want to come up with some other gods and build these other altars and everything else. They're just leading tons of people to hell. That's right. mm -hmm. And that is exactly what they're doing. Even if they're not, you know, abusing them in this lifetime, what does it matter if they're going to spend an eternity in hell? That's right. So God knows this truth, which is why he gives these laws. And flip over to chapter 13 here in chapter 7. This is why this is such a big deal. And he has to explicitly say, don't show mercy, because naturally, you know, especially having the characteristics where we want to have a lot of compassion and mercy, you're going to be tempted to show mercy, especially in these really hard situations that you're, that, that you're put in. But, it, you know, if it's the right thing to do, it's the right thing to do. He's saying you just need to do this and trust God that this is right. He's really saying just trust me and do this and don't have compassion and mercy. How would compassion and mercy look like? Well, by not carrying out the judgment by not executing the things that God said needed to be done. Deuteronomy 13, verse 6, the Bible says, If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or thy wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul. You, you can't get any closer than these relationships that God is, is pointing out here in the law. Your brother, your son, your daughter, your wife, your friend, that's, that's you know, any one of these people could be the closest person to you in the entire world. So if any of these people entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee, or far off from thee, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth, thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him. So not only do you say, uh, No, no, I'm not going to follow your false god. No, I'm not going to convert over to whatever religion you're trying to convert me to. But neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him. So you're saying, don't, don't show pity on that person who's super close to you. Don't spare, meaning don't hold back and don't conceal them or hide them as if it didn't happen. Now, there's many instances where it would be righteous and godly, especially if people are transgressing against you, to conceal the matter, to not make it known, not make a big deal of it, let it go, forgive them. But this is an instance. This is an area where God's saying, don't conceal it. This actually has to be dealt with. Don't show pity. But thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people. Look, that's tough. That's tough. No way around it. That's tough. But you know what it is? God wants him to be first in your life. 
closer than the closest relationship that you have here ought to be with the Lord. Amen. Ought to be with your Lord and Savior. That's, that's number one in your life. And it's not this, look, God understands our relationships and God understands the closeness. He wants strong families and he wants strong relationships and he wants people, you know, having that love towards one another. But this, this is a line in the stand. This is drawn out saying, you do not cross this line. You do not go and try to entice people and lead them away into some phony religion. You don't do it. Because if people do that, you put them to death. And you don't pity them and you don't hide them. And that is the way that it needs to be. Look, this is God's righteous law. He understands this better than we do. Now, the result of this, if we keep reading, verse 10 says, And thou shalt stone him with stones that he die, because he has, hath sought to thrust thee away from the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And all Israel shall hear and fear, and shall do no more any such wickedness as this is among you. This is the stopping point where God's going to say, you know what? I'm going to stop the spread of this nonsense by putting a law like this in place. And if people will put that into practice, see, it's one thing to have the law. The law is there. It's another thing to have it in practice. If it's not in practice, it's really of no force. People are going to disregard it. That, I mean, laws of the land, if... if, if, if if, if laws aren't being enforced, as we're seeing, continuing to see even around the whole country, there's, there's laws against stealing, but in how many places now, especially in liberal states, are those laws not even being enforced at all? And people are walking into stores and looting and taking stuff, and oh, as long as it's not too much money, then they just let them go. They don't even prosecute against it. But what good is having the law then if you're not going to try to uphold the law? That, then, you know what that leads to? More people. So instead of trying to stop you, oh, we don't have the resource for it. Look, you're going to just make it worse. Because now more people are going to do They're going to find out, oh, hey, oh, you mean nothing's going to happen? I mean, how many people don't do things because of the threat of something bad happening? I mean, that, that's tons of people. Most people don't just be like, well, that's just wrong. I'm not going to do that. Now, that's how we should be. That's how we should be. But I mean, you think about, there's a lot of fools out there. And especially, you know, there's a lot of foolish children. You know, foolishness is, heart, is bound in the heart of a child. Kids do all kinds of stupid things. I know, because I was one, right? You know, when, when you're younger, preteen, teenage years, and you get around other people, and you get around, you know, I remember the big thing, you know, people are just talking about stealing. I had no desire until I hear other people talking about it and doing it, and like, oh, yeah, man, I got it. And then it's just kind of like, what? Like, you... you you just, you just have this stuff? Like, hey, I want one of those things, right? You get this covetousness going and, and that, that wicked, you know, sins kind of, kind of forming in your heart and you start thinking about this stuff more. Well, how much worse is it? See, then when I was a kid, there was always a threat of getting caught. And if you get caught, there's going to be something that <laughs> you're going to get in trouble, right? And in some cases, people are going to juvie or whatever, you know, like they're going to the juvenile prisons and stuff. Like there was, obviously it depends on what they did. But there's always that threat. But nowadays, it's like, how many more kids now are going to see this stuff going like, yeah, I walked right past the security guard. Or I walked right past, you know, like, no one came. They got me on camera. That just emboldens people to continue to do wickedly. And, you know, the bleeding hearts want to say, no, 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 we need to, you know, you need to understand where they're at. And, they're, you know, like, look, no, you need to have a stopping point. There needs to be a point where you say we're not going to show that mercy and we're not going to have that compassion. And, you know, we've given you plenty of grace, yeah. but this is a stopping point. And when it comes to capital crimes, especially, there's a stopping point. And, and you know, it drives me nuts when, when I hear believers, or at least so-called, I mean, believers, let's just call them believers, I don't know, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to speak for everybody individually, but when believers will say, are against the death penalty, against capital punishment, and here's the argument that they always bring, well, I mean, God wants those people to be saved. But God made a law. Yeah. Right. Okay? And it ought to be followed, and here's the thing. You can have both. Yeah. You can have both. A person could be on trial to be put to death. How about you give them the gospel then? 
And then they can be saved, but then for society's good, you can still put that guy to death so other people can hear and fear and go, hey, maybe we shouldn't commit murder. Right. Instead of going, no, 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 but we need to keep them alive as long as, look, there's plenty of people that shouldn't be kept alive as long as possible because they're going to keep doing over and over again these crimes like the reprobates. There's no fixing some people, the psychopaths. There's no fixing them. Keeping them alive longer is just putting everybody at a greater risk. There are people where you, it has to be just, okay, no more compassion, no more pity. Look at chapter 19, Deuteronomy chapter 19, I'm almost done. Verse 11, chapter 19. But if any man hate his neighbor and lie in wait for him and rise up against him and smite him mortally that he die and fleeth into one of these cities, then the elders of his city shall send and fetch him thence and deliver him into the hand of the avenger of blood that he may die. Now, I didn't read all this in context. It's talking about someone who's committing first degree murder. It's talking about someone who they knew what they were doing. It wasn't an accident. They killed someone. They murdered someone. And then they ran off into one of these slayer cities where, where the whole point of having these cities set up was that if someone did kill someone accidentally, they could go into another city so that they wouldn't have to worry about running into their family members, which would be like an avenger of blood who's really upset and angry that their relative died and is going to be seeking justice. And the avenger of blood in God's law would be the one who's going to carry out that sentence and, and it was right to be able to allow that person to get the justice against. Now, obviously, everything had to be done decently and in order. But there was still also the concern that before you even get to that point, <laughs> right, of being able to have a trial and investigate stuff, that the person whose family member is, is just going to take care of business. And, and if it's found out that that person, let's say, let's say someone... Let's say someone kills my physical brother. Someone kills one of my brothers, right? And we're living together, and I, and I know who did it, and I know, like, like, there's no doubt. Maybe I even saw him. Then, like, I go and kill that guy. Nothing's going to happen to me as long as it happened the way it, I'm saying it happened, right? <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't uh, some, some other uh, lies going on or whatever. But that would be the thing. And now here's the thing. Let's say one of my brothers is out at work. He's on the job. And someone else does something stupid, but not intentional at all. And then my family member ends up losing his life. Well, I'm going to be mad at that person. Because in a way, he caused the death of, of, you know, in my, of my family member. But because people get really upset and emotional, understandably so, I could maybe go out and try, to, and try to kill that person because I'm so upset about that, but they set up these cities of refuge for people to go so they could kind of be away from the situation and be able to not get killed by somebody and, um, and, and, go, and, and, then, and then they would do the discovery and figure out, okay, what's going on here? What are the facts? And be able to hold a, a decent trial and be able to figure out what's going on. So in this situation, though, it's something, it's somebody that... Um, he runs into one of these cities of refuge, but then they start investigating. It says in verse 12, Then the elders of the city shall send and fetch him thence and deliver him into the hand of the avenger of blood that he may die. Thine eyes shall not pity him, but thou shalt put away the guilt of innocent blood from Israel that it may go well with thee. So yeah, this guy ran away. He was seeking refuge, but you know what? He's guilty of murder and justice needs to be served. So he's going to be put to death. And he says, Thine eyes shall not pity him. The law also says you're not supposed to take any satisfaction, meaning no payment, no monetary payment. Let's say someone's really rich that commits a crime of murder. You can't just be like, oh, well, I'll, I'll pay the family $5 million. Is that okay? Can we settle this debt? God says, you know, the righteous judge should say no. In God's judgment, no. You can't satisfy that penalty, a, a capital crime, with any amount of money doesn't matter. He says you can't satisfy that. It needs to just be death. And these days, in our, in our justice system, there's people getting deals all the time. All the time on all these different crimes. Capital crimes that should be capital crimes. 
and all these details and just, oh, well, if you just tell us more information, then you could have life in prison. Or, you know, it's like, look, we should, no one should be making these deals at all. Deals shouldn't be made. If someone commits a capital crime, they need to be put to, they need to be prosecuted and rightfully found guilty if they're guilty and then speedily executed. The Bible also says there in, in chapter 19, look at verse number 16, talk about false witness. I'm going to wrap it up here. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges which shall be in those days, and the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall you do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you. So whatever someone's lying about, if they're trying to get someone else in trouble, whatever the punishment should have been for that person, if you find out this guy's lying, then they get that punishment. That's as simple as that. Let's keep reading. Verse number 20. And those which remain shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. This is to prevent people from lying under oath. Verse 21. And thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. People know all about eye for eye, tooth for tooth, but they don't often know where it's coming from. It's talking in context about false witnesses. So if the punishment against the person committing a crime is going to be, well, they've got to have their eye plucked out, or they've got to have their hand chopped off, or whatever it is, and they get convicted because someone's lying about it, or almost convicted, or whatever, right? Someone's lying about bringing forth accusation against them, and they're, and they're false accusations then that person gets that judgment. And you say, and, and even if it's about, you know, oh yeah, I saw this guy kill this other guy. Hey, look, if you're, if you're wrong about that, if you're giving a false witness, you better be able to back that up with your own life. Yeah. Yeah. And the society better be able to say, yep, he lied, false witness, put him to death and not have pity. And say, but he didn't actually do anything. He just, he just said, the, look, there's always a story. And that's one of the things that disgusts me about, you know, I, I will confess my fault to you. I have a tendency to, to follow a lot of crime documentaries and stuff. I just get, get interested in, in, in these things. But all of them, at least these days, seem to just have this slant and this skew that's totally against the death penalty. Every single one of them is trying to, to push this agenda on you of going, you know, having all this compassion and pity and stuff. It's like, look, what did this person do? Look, everyone has a story. Everyone has a backstory. Everyone has an upbringing. And, and it's horrible sometimes things that happen to people. Like a lot of the psychopaths, reprobates, you know, they have a horrible childhood. I get it. But you can't have the compassion. The person who's just killing and eating people. Like... Whatever happened in the past is done. You start doing these things, it's death. That's it. That's it. That's the way it has to be. Thine eye shall not pity. I'm not going to go over this last point. Um, there's one more example of where the Bible says not to pity, and, and it's if a, a woman grabs an area on a man where she didn't grab, you have to cut off her hand. And the Bible says that don't pity. Now, we might think it's kind of funny because it's kind of a weird thing in general, but you know, when God makes laws, he makes them for a reason. And no matter what it is, we need to be able to say there's a point, there's a limit, especially where the Bible says, hey, don't pity here, then don't pity. Because you are not more loving than God. We ought to have great pity and compassion and mercy, absolutely. And especially when people sin against you. But there are some instances, there are some instances where you go, okay, no, this needs to stop. We, we can't just keep pitying people because justice needs to be served. And it's for the good of everybody. It's for the good of society. It's for the good of the people. It's right in the eyes of God. We need to do what's right in God's eyes. We need to have law that's in place. And finally, justice needs to be served, you know, even when it's unpleasant, but also speedily. 
You know, in our society, if people get convicted of a capital crime, it could take like decades before it's ever carried out. And I don't know the stats on it, but I'm willing to guess that there's probably more people dying in prison than actually being put to death that are on death row. And this never gets to their execution point. And that's wrong on many, many levels. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11, this is the last verse. Ecclesiastes 8, 11 says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. So it's not just the sentence, but the sentence needs to be executed, carried out speedily. You know, there's a reason for having a speedy trial in the United States of America. You're supposed to be able to have a speedy trial. It's not supposed to go on for years and years and years. Now look, diligent inquisition needs to be made. You need to have the facts. It needs to be proper. It needs to be done in order. It shouldn't just be like, okay, hang them up right, you know, right now without, without any type of, of investigation. However, it, should, it shouldn't take too long to get the facts, uncover the facts, get this stuff. Wh whatever that amount of time is, there's a reasonable amount of time that we should be able to come to and say, okay, now we're going to prosecute and we're going to look at this. And once the judgment is handed down, you need to have that sentence executed. Because as you have people, like now the capital punishment is a joke. I mean, even people thinking about doing some crime and they're like, well, I could be put to death for it. Yeah, put to death for it, but you'll be on death row for 30 years. They already, you know, most of these criminals are living a, a criminal lifestyle. They already know there's a threat of going to jail, going to prison. So what if it's a capital crime? If they're not even being carried out and executed, so what? Now you've taken a, a much larger offense of a capital crime and made it essentially like any of the other crimes. Who cares? There's no force. And, and it's because of people having too much compassion and pity that has destroyed the judgment that needs to take place and it just festers and it rots in a society and makes it worse. We need to go back to the way that God said to, to do things. It's the right way. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, your wisdom. I pray that you please help all of us, first and foremost, to have the compassion and love and, pit and, and pity, dear Lord, that we ought to have towards people, especially those that do us wrong when we feel slighted, when we have people come against us, but that we would also remember the, the hard stops. And, and remember, Lord, that these are extreme in, in, in the word. These are not... Um, <laughs> the, the, it doesn't rise to the level of someone's personal attack on us, but it more so has to do with, with extremely uh, heinous crimes or things that are, that are um, much more serious where we see those stopping points. So up to those stopping points, up into the sin unto death, dear Lord, I pray that you would please help us all to have the right discernment and judgment, to have uh, compassion, that, that is modeled after your compassion. Mercy that's modeled after your mercy. And God, help us to, um, to overcome our own pride and um, be able to be selfless as Christ was selfless. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.